Dr. Kaufman is Innovation and White Space Lead for New Product Development R&D for GSK Healthcare. Dr. Kaufman is affiliated with the Kuapa and Pawnee Nations of Oklahoma and currently chairs the Executive Compensation Committee for the Kuapa Nation of Oklahoma. He received a BS in biochemistry from the Uni University of Kansas and a PhD in pharmaceutical chemistry from the University of Kansas. Prior to his position at GSK, he led intellectual property and informational research for global healthcare at the, at the Procter and Gamble Company. He has served on the board of directors of SACNAS, the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Hispanics, Native Americans in Science, and was a member of the executive committee of SACNAS as well. Welcome, Dr. Alan Kaufman, and thank you very much for joining us today. We look forward to your remarks. All right, well, thank you very much for uh, being here today. Um, and thank you to Dr. Komarov for inviting me to, to share my perspective of leadership in STEM with you. Um, I, I hope that you find what I have to say interesting as far as my trajectory and experience and, and industry. Um, just a little bit of a, a agenda here. I'm gonna talk a little bit about my background. Uh, I'm gonna talk about how I approach leadership um, and in terms of industry and why DEI matters little bit about my leadership trajectory and then uh, some things that GSK does to go beyond with regards to uh, DEI and uh, social responsibility as well as uh, GSK consumer health care obviously they're uh, they're paying me to be here so I want to make sure that I put in a plug for the number one consumer health care company in the world so why am I here uh, as um, Dr. Lopez mentioned I am uh, indigenous so I, I affiliate with the Quapaw Nation of Oklahoma and the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma. I hold a doctorate in pharmaceutical chemistry and I work for GSK Consumer Healthcare. So um, URG, STEM scientist working in industry. And as I looked at the goals of the workshop, um, I just wanted to highlight some of the things that I hope that you take away from what I am talking about today. Um, really the pathway uh, for myself uh, talking a little bit about the programs that helped provide me these experiences uh, to help, um, you know, support and, but also kind of prepare uh, me for leadership positions. Uh, and then a little bit, you know, as I talked about GSK, uh, incentivizing, incentivizing institutional change um, through policies uh, and companies. So I'm a chemist. I talk in sometimes reactions. And so, you know, Obtaining a position of leadership in a STEM field within the private sector is, is a product of both the individual person, so me, but also others that are in that reaction. You have to accept this. If you do, it'll help improve your yield in the future and that yield being uh, leadership positions. So the way I think about leadership in industry is, is kind of like an S-curve. Uh, this is how I approach innovation. Uh, looking at white space and innovation and product development trends, things like that, how you must invest. And then ultimately there's a growth phase and then a stagnation phase. It's the same thing with a career or time in a role or whatever. Um, you invest time at the beginning, you establish yourself as a scientist, you start to discover things, you know, autonomously, you demonstrate that, that skill set, And then at some point, right, those are all individual contributions. Um, we call those individual contributors in industry where you're the one doing the work, um, discovering the new things. And typically you can do that uh, through uh, apprenticeships or guidance from senior technologists or scientists. But at some point, there's a tipping point. You, you end up not just demonstrating, but actually leading. You find yourself accelerating your ideas. You find yourself at some point looking back and serving others and in order to do that, you know, you, you've established yourself through this, through this S curve. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted to talk about, and I hope that you kind of take from my talk is that there are people at each one of these steps that help you. It's not just you, even though I said individual contributors, there's a lot of mentorship. There's a lot of guidance that happens in each one of these steps. But in order to do that, this just isn't just one set of curves. This is actually uh, an, uh, an aggregate of curves. And so 
while you might have invested and, and established yourself and are working through one specific role, eventually you'll stagnate. And so you want to, what you want to do is you want to be able to start to grow. You want to be able to start to build on all of these experiences, all of this scientific foundation that you've grown in yourself and invested in yourself um, that then starts to build. And you have, a, you, you have a choice, either you can let it stagnate and you have this red line that kind of just, you know, doesn't have as much impact or you can continue to grow and ultimately end up, you know, yielding more impact um, in a leadership position over time. And the reason I bring that up is because one of the biggest things that I think that most folks, especially, um, you know, as a, as a person um, of indigenous background is, you know, we come from, you know, a certain culture, you know, and that culture has certain different behaviors, leadership behaviors. Have, we have, um, you know, sometimes difficulty looking people in the eye, and that can be a negative leadership trait because, you know, um, we're very humble people. But what, we, what I'd like to have a discussion about is really how do we identify those inflection points? those infl inflection points that basically say that we're not going to stagnation, we're gonna go to a new phase of growth for ourselves so we can have a, a larger impact so that we can become those leaders that we, we truly um, have the capability to be. And so one of the things that you know, I, I do and have done is to analyze my trends and behaviors, my contribution, my growth over time, my responsibilities. I put that into context you know, of how I've operated uh, successfully. Navigating an inflection point is one of the most important things you can do because it's at that point where it makes or breaks uh, the next phase of what, what it is that you're trying to achieve. Um, and so really you have to understand your capabilities and experiences. You have to start to open doors. We've heard a lot about uh, mentors, but networks are also very important. We have to lean on our champions. We have to uh, lean on those champions and those mentors and external colleagues for guidance. One of the things about, and I'll show you this in, in my S-curve, is I cannot understate the, the impact that having a champion for you in a company matters to getting to a leadership position. If you do not have a boss that advocates for you or a manager that's giving you the right opportunities, there is, is little chance that you will achieve that success. Now, how not to navigate an inflection point is something that I think folks also need to have a little bit of an understanding of. Avoidance and seeking help, closing yourself off, not upskilling, exploring possibilities, and leaning too heavily on the things that have gotten you to that point so far. We all have to grow. And so those are things that I think that, you know, folks that are aspiring to be leaders need to kind of understand and be self-aware. You need to be prepared, have an ability to adapt, really, really build your network and be humble um, in everything that you do. So my trajectory. So uh, as you know, in 1999, I started as a pre-pharmacist. I wanted to improve the lives of people using pharmaceuticals. Uh, at the time, I think it was genetic pharmaceuticals that were kind of, was kind of the buzzword that really, really excited me. And I thought that pharmacy would be the way to do that, being from a small town in Southeast Kansas. Well. Little did I know that I didn't want to be a pharmacist, but I wanted to research uh, the mechanisms of, of drug actions and be able to modify those drugs in order to provide a benefit. And so through um, the Office for Diversity and Science Training, um, I was actually uh, taken under an IMSD grant. And that, that paid me to do research in a, in a lab, in Dr. Middaw's lab at the University of Kansas in the pharmaceutical chemistry department. And so I did that work for three, four years until I was uh, admitted into that same department under the advice of Dr. Jeff Kreiss, working on uh, intracellular pharmacokinetics of amine-containing drugs uh, to help benefit uh, cancer chemotherapeutic uh, applications. I defended in 2008 and then was, uh, uh, my first role was at PNG. So at PNG, um, I was able to do a lot with over-the-counter drugs. Um, I had various different roles in that. And then from there, I leveraged that experience in intellectual property and information research into looking at external innovation in a more regulated sector of medical device innovation. And then from there, kind of combining those two skill sets, 
I am now the white space and innovation lead for GSK Consumer Healthcare. And throughout that entire experience, I've not only learned new skills, but I've also created a bigger impact in each organization that I, I, I go to. So below all that are the things that have helped support that, that trajectory. And so when I mean below all that, I mean the things that I've done that have you know, been available to me to help create not only visibility, but apprenticeship, mentorship, um, leadership guidance, and just general opportunities to grow my skill set. And so initially it was, I had never done lab-based research. Well, there you go, KU IMSD Grant and Dr. Jim Orr. Thank you very much, that, that really helped. Uh, I went to my first SACNIS conference and was able to pr uh, present nationally my, my scientific research in front of a pretty diverse um, organization and scientists. Um, from there, I, I obviously hit the role at PNG, but then from that, it was, I was only getting the one worldview from PNG. What about the other different types of leadership that are out there that I can learn from? And so I was actually admitted to the Lin Linton Pudry Leadership Institute that SACNAS uh, had as a program in their organization. From there, one of the, the goals of, of that leadership institute was to start to broaden my impact in the DEI space. And so companies, as many of you are aware, have different ERGs. Um, and those are really, really good opportunities for aspiring leaders to get involved with. Not only does it provide access to executive sponsors, but different types of leaders that have different uh, experiences, backgrounds from you to learn from. So I actually co-led the Native American Network at PNG for several years, was then um, looking to, again, broaden my skill set, went to the SACNIS Board of Directors, was elected there, and learned a little bit about nonprofit governance and um, how those different types of organizations operated um, with oversight of the fiduciary aspect. Um, and between there, we, me and my wife started a small business, which was great. Um, and then I was able to get a little bit more exposure to operations and um, government through the Executive Compensation Committee, which they, they have committees for everything. Um, but really, this is a board that oversees the compensation and the recommendations for compensation for the executives in the nation. And so I'm learning now from CEOs of companies on how to set this, how to manage this, and make it sustainable. So as you can see, everything I've, I've done, I've built but I've utilized these different programs um, to help enable my growth. And in doing so, I've worked on some really cool stuff. These are all the brands that I've worked on and I couldn't have done it without all of that support. But really at the bottom line, it's people. So in each one of those different um, lines into that S curve, it was one of these folks that was pushing me that was opening that door. So whether it was uh, Mr. Metzger in seventh grade science or Joseph Bird, chairman of the Quapaw Nation, really just giving those opportunities to lead. You have to know who those people are in your life. And those are the mentors. Those are the champions. Those are the people in your organization that are going to lift you up, push you to do better and always fight for you. One of the things that I've learned along the way is that I am now that person in other people's lives. And so really just advocating to do this work uh, for my nations and also for the people in my organization. So uh, going beyond, so kind of switching gears a little bit more into the, the corporate world, GSK operates on, on three different principles, our people, our business, our communities. And I think they have some good examples of, of ways that they're making a difference in the space. And so these are things, every single thing that you see here is something that I could be involved with at a leadership level, I could get integrated into each one of these activities and make a difference. And this is, you know, incremental to my day job of, of leading uh, white space and innovation for new product development, but just kind of articulates the point that these are now opportunities for people to get involved. So I can recruit, we can maintain programs to develop and retain diverse talent. These are some of the metrics of which GSK wants to uh, improve that situation. So by 2025, they aspire to have 45% female representation in senior roles. Similarly, 30% ethnically diverse leaders and VP and above roles. And so 
you know, active programs for URG development. We have those programs. I am actively involved in some of those programs as well as ERG leadership uh, in the company. The business aspect. And so I think this goes without saying, but just want to kind of point it out that when you combine gender and ethnic diversity, uh, the McKinsey study shows that, you know, 25% of all of that is, is basically rolled up into these companies are going to have 25% better financial performance than those that are less diverse. So, you know, we take that into consideration and then our communities. So we are very active in our communities at the local level. I'm in Richmond. So we do a lot in the Richmond communities with different schools. Um, but then also here's a good example of GSK in Philadelphia, uh, creating and supporting the Philadelphia STEM equity initiative. And so there's a lot of not only, um, dollar capital, but a lot, a lot of also people capital that's spent to uh, help further and enable those um, with opportunities similar to how I explained in my, my trajectory. And then here's the shameless plug. I'm not going to go through it, but um, I just wanted to say thank you uh, for your time. Uh, if you'd like to connect with me on LinkedIn, happy to continue the conversation and happy to uh, answer any questions you may have. Thank you.